In honor of White Lotus Season 2 recently ending, we've compiled some Easter eggs, red herrings, and hidden references from Seasons 1 and 2. So grab your sunscreen and your Italian translation book and let's get started. First, let's break down some hidden gems in Season 2, since hopefully it's all still fresh as mozzarella in our brains. Ok, let's get right to the big reveal. If you're watching this video, you've seen both seasons, right? If not, spoilers are coming, including this next statement. Tanya is the one who dies in Season 2. It was definitely sad to see our beloved Stifler's mom kick the bucket, but eagle-eyed viewers might have actually picked up on a variety of clues throughout the season that she was the one destined to be found floating in the Ionian Sea. The first clue was actually in Season 1, because as we all know, Tanya and her now-husband Greg are the only holdover characters from the sunny shores of Maui. And while Greg's health issues have since gone away, at the end of last season he was apparently terminally ill. The two have a heartfelt discussion towards the end of Season 1, and in it, Tanya informs Greg that she's had every type of treatment under the sun. I've had every kind of treatment over the years. Then she comments, Death is the last immersive experience I haven't tried. Series creator and writer Mike White has admitted this line was the sending off point of his notion that maybe Season 2 would be her journey to death. He said that while he was sad to see the character and the incandescent Jennifer Coolidge go, he thought that giving her a very operatic conclusion would serve the season quite well. Next, there were clues hidden in Season 2, the biggest of which is the fact that in the final episode, Tanya is wearing a pink floral dress. Let's jump back to the episode featuring the Godfather house. During the brief shot inside the car there, we saw the mannequin meant to represent Apollonia from the Godfather, and what was she wearing? You guessed it. So when Tanya shows up in the same dress several episodes later, we have to assume she's going to be the one who goes kaboom. Except of course, she doesn't actually blow up in a car, that would have been a little too on the nose, and Mike White is far too clever for that. However, that doesn't mean good old Mike didn't leave us all a teensy clue that her demise would be via a clumsy move from a boat. Because in the first episode of Season 2, Tanya arrives and literally stumbles as she disembarks from the boat, bringing her to the hotel. So in retrospect, that was a pretty huge nod to her death. But you can certainly be forgiven for not figuring it out then. I've definitely forgiven myself and actually bought myself some ice cream today, but that's just the guy I am. Moving on! Remember the scene in the finale on the boat where Tanya shoots everybody and we find out her conniving husband Greg had been on the boat the whole time? Yeah, neither do I. Because we definitely didn't see Greg at all in that scene. However, it's possible we heard him. Several people on Reddit have reported that they watched the finale with the closed captioning on, and in that scene, there's a moment where a character named Greg Hunt yells, Tanya! Tanya? Uh. Did the closed captioning person give away a slight twist in the plot? Hard to say. Because, first off, other Redditors commented that they had their captions on too, and theirs didn't have Greg listed as having any dialogue in the scene. So that's a little weird to say the least. And there are arguments as to whether or not it would make sense plot-wise. Greg, who was clearly in cahoots with the gang known affectionately as The Gays to kill Tanya, might have wanted to be there to make sure it all went to plan, or perhaps to celebrate coming into half a billion dollars. Others have pointed out that he would have been pretty dumb to stick around, and potentially be implicated in her death. Maybe only Mike White and a certain lucky caption typist knows for sure. There are several parallels to the famous Italian movie La Ventura and its star Monica Vitti. Tanya tells Greg that she wants to have a day befitting Monica Vitti, and he sets one up for her. They go on a wonky Vespa ride, eat pasta and clams, etc. But there's more to it than that. The ensuing storyline, where Greg leaves town so that his wife can be killed, is actually eerily similar to what happens in La Ventura. In it, a man has an affair with the best friend of his lover. This happens after they're on a vacation where the lover, Anna, complains that he's too focused on his work, and that they're supposed to be on a vacation. Sound familiar? And here's the kicker. Anna ends up going missing while on a frickin' boat in the Ionian Sea. So yeah, Tanya got the love into it a treatment, alright? Oddly enough, the scene earlier in the season, where Greg has a discreet phone call on a balcony, was shot on the same balcony as a scene in La Aventura featuring Monica Vitti. This was sort of planned, though sort of by happenstance. That's because the show apparently visited more than 70 local hotels before settling on the San Domenico Palace Hotel, so it was a happy coincidence. Finally, there was another overt parallel to La Aventura. The scene where Harper briefly walks around alone in Noto and is surrounded by staring Italian men is a shot-for-shot -shot remake of a scene in La Aventura, filmed in the same exact location. Holy Quentin Tarantino, Mike White!
During a deep convo in the fifth episode, Daphne and Harper talk about the issue of Cameron's potential infidelity. Daphne dodges the topic a bit, telling Harper she should do what she did, which is to get a trainer. She talks about the trainer she's been working with and describes him as having blonde hair and big blue eyes. She scrolls through her photos, then hands the phone to Harper. Harper is surprised to see she's not looking at a photo of a trainer, but rather of Daphne's two kids, who happen to have blonde hair and big blue eyes. Since that episode, there have been debates on social media as to what that moment meant. Some people think it was Daphne reminding Harper that she has a family and that probing too hard into the infidelity would mess up a good thing, aka mind your business, Harper. But others, me included, think it was her way of revealing that not only does she cheat on Cameron, but that the kids aren't his. No wonder he's allowed to do whatever the bleep he wants. You might have recognized the two women whom Daphne talks to in the opening scene of the season. That's because they were played by Angela Keeley and Kara Kay, who, along with Mike White and his dad Mel, were on Survivor, David vs. Goliath in 2018. This was a nice continuation of a trend started in Season 1, when Mike cast another Survivor Season 37 contestant, Alec Merlino, as a bartender in the Hawaiian Hotel. Speaking of which, let's talk about some hidden gems and fun facts from Season 1. The idea has been floated that Greg was setting up a plot to steal from Tanya in Season 1, and there are some good reasons to think that now that we know his eventual intentions. For starters, they met when Tanya caught him trying to get into her hotel room. He claimed he got the room numbers mixed up. But is it possible he was trying to sneak into her room to gauge just how rich she actually was? You bet it is. He also asked her out only after finding out she didn't have a family, which could mean he was figuring out if anyone else would be in line to inherit her riches. There's also the fact that his coughing fits appear to come up at seemingly convenient times over the season, like right after they slept together and after she suggests picking up an extra house in Colorado to be near him. Plus, there's the fact that he claims to be so sick he might die at any moment, yet we see him clearly swimming laps in the hotel's pool. The whole thing is pretty fishy. That or it makes total sense and we're overthinking it. One of those two. Most murder mysteries are set up so that we find out who's killed early on and spend the rest of the time trying to figure out who the murderer was. But White Lotus turns this formula on its head, and we're left guessing who gets killed. As such, there are a ton of classic red herrings to make us think that one character or another are gonna get deaded. Here are a few fun ones from Season 1. Early on, we see that Mark is awaiting test results for testicular cancer. So while that wouldn't be murder per se, it's possible he could die from it during the trip. That option is later nullified when he finds out the tests were negative. Later, Mark gives us another red herring when he gets sloshed before going on a scuba lesson with his son Quinn. Quinn even calls it out, reminding Mark they'll be underwater in a bit, but Mark keeps on drinking. So that was a fake out that maybe he'd drown during a scuba lesson or excursion. We also see Paula and Olivia in possession of a fairly hefty stash of drugs in Episode 1. That's laying the foundation that maybe one of them will die of an overdose. But that red herring is also somewhat squashed when they end up losing their bag of pills on the beach. There's also the fact that Paula sneaks behind Olivia's back and hooks up with Kai, the hotel employee. Their friendship gets hugely strained, and perhaps it was leading to the point where Olivia would be sent into a murderous rage. Or perhaps not. These are just a few of the many subtle clues that kept everyone guessing. Other things include showing what a vindictive and hot-tempered jerk Shane was, insinuating that maybe he loses his cool and kills his wife. Or maybe she kills him first. After all, we saw things getting worse and worse for her over the course of the season. The storyline of Mark finding out his father had been gay and had died of AIDS, not cancer, was a fascinating one. It led Mark on an emotional and spiritual roller coaster as he tried to figure out what this info meant for his own sanity. What you might not know is that this parallels Mike White's own real-life story. His father is named Mel White, and he spent much of his life as a far-right-leaning evangelical pastor. This included having a very strong anti-LGBTQ stance. In an early scene, Mark flashes his naked manhood to his wife. Steve Zahn, who played Mark, revealed that after he inquired if he would be required to do frontal nudity, the production team assured him he wouldn't. The plan was to use a prosthetic, as tends to happen a lot in film and TV these days. In fact, Steve wasn't even used in the shot. They ended up putting the prosthetic member onto a body double. That's because they didn't need Steve's face in the shot, and it saved him from having to be in a makeup chair for two hours. But Zahn did point out that he did get final approval over the prosthetic they used. 
That must have been an interesting conversation with the art department. So there you have it. I won't blame you if you paused halfway through to go look up how much a night at that Sicilian hotel costs. Spoiler, it's more than $1,000 a night. Same with the Four Seasons in Maui. So good luck with that. But hopefully, when you came back, you enjoyed learning some fun hidden gems from this fantastic show. Stay safe out there. And as always, try not to jump from one boat to the next, especially in heels.